And a very warm welcome to COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. My name is Caitlin Wee and I'm a third year medical student at NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine. This is a series of webinars presented by NUS Yong Lulin School of Medicine, National University Health System and Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. The COVID-19 Updates from Singapore weekly webinar series will provide viewpoints and insights from a panel of leading experts in infectious diseases and related specialties and disciplines. It is now my honor to introduce you to our moderator, who is also the program director of this series. Recruited to establish an infectious disease training program in Singapore, he was the first infectious diseases head of department in the Communicable Disease Center here in 1992. He is currently Associate Vice President for Health Innovation and Transformation, National University of Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, Associate Professor David Allen. Thank you, Caitlin. Good evening and welcome to the 19th installment of our webinar, COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. We hope you're safe, secure and happy. We thank you for taking time from your busy day to be with us. The topic for tonight's discussion will be COVID-19 clinical trials, from concept to results. Our guest expert this week to help us explore that idea is Professor Peter Horby, whom I'll formally introduce after Dale's epidemiology update. Just to remind you, our format this week will entail Dale Fisher, who'll start us off with an update of regional and international COVID-19 epidemiology. Then Professor Horby will provide a detailed review of this evening's topic. It's to be followed by a question and answer period. Please send in your questions. There's a tab at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen that allows you to do so. Peter is a world-renowned clinical investigator. This is your chance to ask an expert. There's over a thousand watching tonight. We'll get to as many of your questions as possible. After the Q&A, they will provide weekly review of current events, following which I'll provide a preview of next week's guest expert and reveal the mystery pandemic song of the week. Without further ado, allow me to introduce Dale Fisher, Professor of Medicine, National University of Singapore, Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, Senior Consultant, Division of Infectious Disease, National University Hospital, and Chair of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, hosted by World Health Organization. Dale, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, let's walk you around the world. You can see my slides? Yep. Great. Uh, so, um, I'll start as I always do with the Johns Hopkins uh, uh, graphic. Uh, you can see this is what's happened over the last week from the 6th of August to the 13th of August. And it's pretty flat. We've done another 1.8 million people. So we were always going to cross the 20 million mark. These are diagnosed uh, PCR positive cases. And we've gone up uh, 42,000 deaths through that time. So that's fairly consistent with where we normally are. 
Uh, globally, there's, uh, th this is uh, a smaller graphic this week of the, uh, of the um, global epi curve. So you can see that that's uh, settling into roughly 250,000 cases uh, uh, a day and five to 7,000 uh, deaths a day. And you can see across the world the countries that are affecting it most. So new cases are, are now the uh, India is making the most diagnoses. This is over one day, so it's not, uh, not uh, hard and fast, but uh, US has come down a bit. Uh, still Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, the Americas are, are uh, taking the lion's share of this. Um, I'll go through each of these a little bit later. And the, uh, the deaths likewise in India, uh, over 800, US over 500, Brazil. So these are, are still uh, uh, driving most of it. The uh, epi curves for each of the WHO regions hasn't changed that much. PAHO, uh, Pan American Health Organization might just be turning a corner, but the, the deaths are slightly trending up. Um, Europe is, is continuing uh, with the, the sort of east versus west uh, uh, different different shapes, although the the western uh, Western Europe uh, epi curves are, are seeing a little bit of the effects of uh, summer frivolities. I think uh, Ciaro is largely driven as as it has been for most of the time by India, and that's obviously a fairly relentless uh, movement upwards. Um, Eastern Mediterranean uh, on the turn, but the, these not high number of deaths tells us that there's a lot of uh, a lot of diagnoses not being made. Uh, Africa um, uh, may be flattening out. Uh, Western Pacific region, our region, clearly not uh, not flattening out, and there are uh, good reasons for that. So, in the Western Pacific, um, you can see this is the number of new cases in the last 24 hour, hours, uh, at least probably two days ago. Um, so, Philippines, Japan, and you can see the shape of the curves as well. Uh, Australia, um, Singapore, flattening off and coming down. Um, and, and the deaths are really not, not in large number, but uh, Philippines, Japan and Australia are responsible for, for most of those. Let's, uh, let's look at those countries in a, in a little more detail now. So we've spoken about the Australian outbreak a few times. This is uh, low double figure cases in New South Wales, but, uh, but in, uh, in Victoria, uh, it's spread outside of Melbourne now. There's uh, Bendigo, Ballarat are seeing cases. So these are the the, the, the towns within uh, Victoria. Today, they were down in the 200s of cases per day. So that's, that's better than the 400s they've been having, but uh, it, it's in response to a lockdown and it'll be very disappointing if they say they've done really well to get the numbers down, because as I've always said, locking down uh, is, is not an outbreak response, it, it, but it will always bring your numbers down. Um, Philippines, uh, They've, they had about 28,000 cases last week, uh, 170 deaths. Altogether, there are about 127,000 cases and 2,200 plus deaths. Um, they've got uh, lockdowns in, in metropolitan Manila uh, and some of the nearby provinces, Bulacan, uh, Laguna, uh, Cavite and Rizal, and apologies for my pronunciation. Um, there's, a, there's community quarantine going on, and I think they're in the middle of, of about two weeks of that, uh, at least until it's reassessed. Uh, they are worried about beds because with these sort of numbers, it's, uh, it's obviously going to uh, test your, your health resources. Um, they're also uh, working hard to, to develop isolation centres rather than, uh, as, as we tend to do in Asia, we like to isolate our positive cases, and, and Philippines, I understand, is... Uh, is doing that and expanding their capacities. Um, so what else have we got? Japan, um, they had uh, uh, an interesting little quirk, um, povidone iodine uh, gargles. Um, there was some very small study that showed that the viral load was a little bit less in people taking the povidone iodine gargles. And this was endorsed by the governor of Osaka. And suddenly they were all bought up uh, and you couldn't buy it in any of the drugstores. So just, uh, Shows you if you want to get something sold, have it in, have it endorsed by your by your leaders. Um, China's got an interesting situation. Uh, I was reading that in uh, there's a 68 year old lady in in Hubei that had COVID 19 in February, and she's just been diagnosed with it again. Now we all know the the 
the stories around, you know, is it viable virus or something? But if we're going to see that uh, immunity wanes, we're going to start seeing it about now, I think. It's, it's been six months. Uh, we know the antibody levels fall off, but we don't really know what it means. And we're probably most likely going to see it in China because they were a month, a month or two or three ahead of most of us. So, so it'd be very interesting to see. I hope they're going to try and culture this virus and, uh, and, uh, and if we're lucky, get some gene sequencing. But uh, no, nonetheless, that's a, that, that's a good little sort of watch this space. Um, so New Zealand is the, the, the talk of the town. They uh, had, a, had a family cluster diagnosed in four people in Auckland. So, so they, they shut Auckland down uh, pretty uh, savagely, I gather. Um, and, uh, and the rest of the country, they've, they've got some sort of limitation with no mass gatherings and social distancing in place for the, for the whole country. So how did this come about? Um, was it occult spread for the last 100 days, unrecognized spread from person to person? It'd take about 20 generations, as we know. Could someone have come through quarantine and, uh, and had a false negative test and been allowed into the country after two weeks and, and then cause spread? Possible, we know false negative tests exist. But uh, the, uh, the theory that's being bandied around the most is e echoing what the Chinese uh, were saying in, in some of their marketplaces that, that got infected and, and indeed they've, they've diagnosed it on, on packaging from uh, chicken, I think today from Brazil and Ecuador shrimps recently. So I'm a, I'm a fan of food importation as a source of, of, um, of seeding an outbreak, not as a major source of spread, but actually uh, going into a place where, where it was previously eradicated. Um, this is um, working with um, uh, Daniel Anderson uh, and, and the group at, uh, at uh, Duke NUS. Uh, we, we, we took some, some virus and actually placed it, just painted it on fish and chicken and pork. And then we cultured it at, at four degrees, which is refrigeration temperature, minus 20, which is normal freezer temperature, and minus 80, which is what we do in, in labs if we really want to just preserve it indefinitely. And you can see that over the course of three weeks, there's really absolutely no drop off in, in the virus. So, so this tells us if something's refrigerated, then, then it can stay there um, uh, for at least three weeks. And, and obviously fresh food, uh, we don't advise to eat fish three weeks after it was caught. So, so this is any, uh, it, it's normally flown in uh, within a couple of days. So this is actually ample time for, uh, for it to seed. So uh, this is unpublished work yet, um, but uh, we'll, we'll try and get it out in the next, uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, let's move on. Um, Southeast Asian region, uh, huge impact from India, Bangladesh, um, and, and that's where, where the deaths are as well. Um, Indonesia is having uh, having around 2,000 cases a day now. They've had 132,000 altogether and total deaths are around 6,000. Um, you, you might remember on around here, I, I told you that Bangladesh had started charging for tests so we could expect that number to come down. So that's what you see, the, the deaths are still going, but actually the cases are coming down. So, so this is, uh, is clearly spurious. Um, European region, uh, you can see this uh, fall in the deaths, um, but the, the cases probably going up through summer and, and, uh, and I think uh, that's because of easing of restrictions and as I say, frivolities. Um, it's really spread through, through every country, uh, has their share. These might sound like big numbers, they, they are big numbers, but, uh, but uh, they're also, um, big countries, Germany's 80 million people. So a thousand a day in 80 million, maybe, uh, I still think it's a bit much, but it's not as bad as it might, might appear. Um, so here, here's what uh, you can see. Uh, and, and I guess the important thing, Spain has obviously had some trouble and done some, some lockdown. And in fact, some places have uh, altered their border restrictions there with them. UK is running along at about a thousand cases a day as is Germany. Um, so, um, uh, so Belgium, 
Uh, this is uh, now the, the hot spot of Europe. Uh, they've got the most cases per capita. Um, they had a, 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 a pork processing plant uh, with 67 infections and 197 workers quarantined. So again, how food can contribute to the spread. Uh, we've spoken about in previous weeks how that can happen. Um, and uh, I think I can leave the rest. So as I said, Eastern Europe still having a, a, a big problem. France having another little tick up. But, but I must say, um, and here's the, the Netherlands ticking up as well. But all in all, considering um, what Europe is, is like at the moment, it's summer holidays, I really think this is quite a quite a good effort. Um, Norway, uh, they've got a cluster. Um, I didn't realise cruise ships were back, so um, they had uh, they had a cruise ship pull into a, a, a port in uh, in uh, one of the uh, Arctic areas, and uh, there were I think four uh, of the of the crew. Uh, infected, and then that turned into 32 of the crew, and now there's uh, there's uh, over 100 people on the ship that are waiting to to disembark. Some have disembarked, but they've been rounded up again. So um, so so cruise ships are are, are going to feature a little bit more again. Uh, Eastern Mediterranean, uh, big impact from Iraq, Iran, Saudi. Um, and uh, Pakistan, that uh, about two or three days ago, came out of a five-month lockdown on Monday. Um, so they've got everything back open again now, I think. So they're, they're about to test. They, un they partially undid this in May, but uh, on Monday, they, uh, they, they reopened up uh, the gyms and cinemas and things like that. So they've had about 280,000 people altogether and still having about 500 infections a day now. So... It'll be interesting to see if, uh, if they can keep these, these numbers down. Uh, I just wanted to, to show you Afghanistan. They've, they've, they've just come out with some serology studies, 31% seropositive. Uh, so you can see with all these sort of high numbers of deaths, but not many cases, obviously they're not, uh, they're not able to, to test adequately. In fact, they've only had about 36,000 cases for 32 million population. So 31% positive is clearly uh, uh, telling you there's a lot more spread than what was recognised. There's about 1,200 deaths altogether there. Um, the Americas, I think I'll uh, slip past a bit of this. The US is having, uh, having more um, uh, rural cases, rural and non-metropolitan cases. Uh, Louisiana says that 25% of its cases are, are linked to bars and restaurants. Um, okay, just uh, Chikwe made it into ProMed. He was on our on our on our show a couple of weeks ago, um, talking about healthcare worker infections. And uh, uh, so, anyway, let's go to Singapore. You can see here that the number of uh, dormitory residents really have come down. Um, over the last few days, uh, as was promised and as was expected. And we've still got uh, um, uh, very few cases in, in the community. So this is very reassuring. But as we all say, let's not uh, count our chickens too early. Um, but, but this is all pretty reassuring and it's reflected here. Uh, our ICU patient was only in there for three days, uh, obviously survived. We've been on 27 deaths for 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 must be a month now, and um, only 90 people in hospitals in Singapore uh, and, and less in the community care facilities. So uh, I'll pass back to you, David, and see you later. Great, Dale. Thanks. That was great. Uh, just tell me, what's the difference between a regular lockdown and a savage lockdown? Yeah, there's lots of different ways to do it. Yeah, David. Okay. It could be very, very savage sometimes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Dale. We'll, we'll talk to you later in the show. Um, and do uh, please send in your questions. Uh, you'll see the tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's my great pleasure to introduce our guest expert tonight. He's Peter Horby, Professor of Emerging Infectious Diseases and Global Health in the Nuffield Department of Medicine, University of Oxford, uh, Executive Director of International Severe Acute Respiratory and Emerging Infection, which is a wonderful organization, and I encourage all of our uh, viewers to uh, go to their website, very informative. Uh, it's a consortium, and he's chief investigator of the recovery trial. The title of uh, Peter's talk tonight is uh, COVID-19 Clinical Trials from Concept to Results. Peter, welcome. 
Great, thank you very much, David. It's a it's a pleasure to be here and, and um, very well organised. Um, I hope I can do you justice. Um, I'll start by sharing my screen. So clinical trials from concepts to results. So uh, David was talking about ISERIC, the International Severe Acute Respiratory and Emerging Infections Consortium. And that really started in 2009 after the sort of pretty abysmal failure to run clinical trials during that pandemic, even though we knew that influenza was going to cause a pandemic at some point. Um, and this graph shows um, really what was the ambition and what actually happened in terms of, of clinical trials for pandemic influenza. So this um, bar on the left shows the number of patients um, that were um, registered in, in trials or, or in protocols to be enrolled in, in pandemic influenza studies. Um, so many, many thousands of patients um, that were um, meant to be enrolled. And then if you look at the actual number of patients enrolled, it, it was, was far, far lower. Um, and then the number of patients enrolled where the results were actually published, because many of the trials didn't publish because they failed to reach their recruitment targets, was very low. And the number of patients um, where the results were available during the pandemic was zero. This is for a pandemic we knew that was coming. Um, really, it was, a, it was a pretty appalling failure. So on the basis of this, ISRIC was set up because we felt it was not acceptable to go through a pandemic and not have advanced uh, our knowledge for improving clinical care at all. Um, so really it was this epidemic curve of, of ideas, many ideas, a few protocols, hardly any patients enrolled um, and zero evidence. So really this is the, our epidemic curve of ambition. Um, and we've really been trying to change this ever since 2009 so that we, we fulfill our ambition with actually improving the evidence base for epidemic infections. So we've made some progress. Um, this is the, a graph of the 2014-2016 um, Ebola outbreak in West Africa. This is um, a graph, uh, I think, from Sierra Leone. Just showing you when the trial started. And so we had a grant awarded um, in September. Um, a trial um, called the JICI trial of Favipiravir um, opened several months later. Our trial opened uh, Brintanofovir in late January. Another trial of Ebola convalescent plasma opened. Then the US trial of ZMAP, the monoclonal antibody, opened. And then we opened a second trial of, 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 of a product called uh, TKM. Um, from the company Tecoviramat. So really we moved from grant of all to opening the BCV trial was three and a half months. Um, given that 20 months is the time that on average it takes from a grant being awarded to a patient being enrolled in a, in a randomized clinical trial. There was a review done um, of clinical trials and 20 months was the median time. So um, we've really reduced it a lot from 20 months to three and a half months, but you can see it's still quite late in the epidemic. We did slightly better, well, quite a bit better, I guess, between um, the BCV trial closing and opening the second trial of TKM, which is 39 days. So we really brought it down a lot in terms of learning how to really accelerate getting all the approvals in place, the operational planning, the training, and getting sites open and running. But still, you'll see that the trials opened quite late, and most of them um, failed to reach their target sample size. And so we came out of that West Africa Ebola outbreak really without much certainty. We had a, um, a positive-ish result for ZMAP based on a Bayesian analysis, which was not confirmed in subsequent trials. So we didn't uh, get far in terms of improving the care of Ebola, but we did make progress in improving our, our abilities with doing clinical trials. The next sort of improvement really was in the Eastern DRC Ebola outbreak of 2018 to 2020, um, where a, a multi-arm trial was started with multiple interventions um, quite early on in the outbreak before the big peak here. And the enrollment was completed <clears throat> during the epidemic. So there was actually a result um, showing that some of the monoclonal antibody products were actually effective in this very severe disease quite remarkably. Um, and then that was rolled out to treatment. So this was the first time really that we saw a trial that um, started early enough to enroll enough patients to reach a definitive conclusion 
and to change practice. This is really fantastic. But I would note that the timeline is really long. You know, this Ebola outbreak was two years and most outbreaks are much shorter than that. So looking at respiratory viruses, you're talking six to eight weeks often for outbreaks. So it's a great achievement, but whether it could be transferred to an acute, very short lived epidemic um, remained a question. And then we have COVID. So as you know, um, end of um, last year, so around 20, December 30, 2019, um, an outbreak was declared. And, and this really has a, um, a, a long partnership with uh, a clinical trialist, uh, Dr. Cao Bin, in um, Beijing. And he was asked by the Academy of Medical Sciences to go to Wuhan to run some clinical research. So because we had that existing partnership through ISERIC, we were able to provide support and um, help Professor Bin and his team to run the trials. And what you can see is that um, we managed to start a trial of lupinavir ritonavir, the HIV drug, a randomized controlled trial, um, very quickly. So we managed to do that within 20 days. So within 20 days of that report to WHO of the cluster of pneumonia cases, we had started a trial in Wuhan and randomized patients. And then we managed to start another trial, not so much uh, longer afterwards, of remdesivir. And this was actually a placebo-controlled randomized trial, which, which we're very pleased with. It started still early on um, in the global pandemic, but unfortunately rather late in the Wuhan epidemic. And so we ended up in a situation where we managed to start the trials very early, but because of the very uh, aggressive lockdown measures uh, in Wuhan, the patient numbers trailed off very quickly. And so we ended up with a situation where we did start them early. Um, probably that was the, the leading record of 20 days, but still was not capturing enough patients to uh, reach a definitive conclusion. So the results from that, those studies, um, this was the Lepinavir study, which um, we enrolled about 200 patients in that, randomised um, hospitalised patients, and on, on the graph, you can see the um, cumulative um, improvement in clinical status using an ordinal scale, much in line with the ordinal clinical scale that WHO is using, uh, which is, you know, you're categorised as, as dead or in ICU or on the wall with oxygen or discharged, and we're looking at improvement through those categories. And you can see, that although lupinavir ritonavir was above control, so the rate of clinical improvement is better, actually... Uh, it wasn't statistically significant due to the small numbers. So the conclusion had to be no significant improvement in mortality or um, time to sort of clinical improvement, um, but the trial was underpowered. So we couldn't exclude a beneficial effect. And this is the remdesivir trial. So this is the placebo controlled trial. It was published in the Lancet, um, again, showing the, on the left here, the, the clinical improvement rate um, with remdesivir above control, but again, not statistically significant, p-value 0.24. Um, so this has to be concluded as a negative trial. But um, there were suggestions it, that, that, that there may be a benefit that, that the trial was not powered to see. So if you look on the right-hand side, you can see the, the Kaplan-Meier plot of time to clinical improvement when we looked at patients who were randomised early in their illness. So this is stratified by duration of illness. This is less than 10 days. And you can see that remdesivir starts to look um, better than c the control when you look at early treatment. So again, you know, an underpowered trial, even though started early, um, overall, you have to call the headline negative, but some indications that a bigger trial could uh, uh, reveal a, a, a clinically, clinical benefit, which is what we have seen with the US trial, which was about a thousand patients. So then um, COVID-19 hits UK. So we've, we worked with Professor Bin to do the two trials in China. Um, and at that time, we were um, seeking funding to run a much bigger platform trial in China. Um, by the time that the grant was awarded, there were very few cases in China and a lot of cases in the UK. So it really shifted. Um, and so we were starting to see a big increase in cases in the UK. So we decided to shift our efforts from China um, to the UK. And that's where we started the recovery trial, which is a, a trial called Randomised Evaluation of COVID Therapies. 
So the, the background to this, uh, it was an unprecedented clinical challenge, overstretched health services. We knew from what we'd seen in Wuhan that it was very likely that the health service in the UK was going to be under extreme pressure. Um, pressure on the beds, pressure on the hospitals, but also pressure on the frontline medical staff um, with a lot of um, unwell patients and a lot of overstretched uh, clinical staff. So we had to make the trial um, operable in that circumstance and a lot of therapeutic uncertainty, many, many candidates being proposed, most of them with very, very little supporting data, um, and so difficult to make a choice. So the principles we followed is that we must be quick, even with 20 days in, in Wuhan, we, we failed to recruit enough patients to have a definitive answer. It must be simple, because people are going to be extremely um, stretched, and they just wouldn't be able to recruit patients if we had a complex trial protocol. And it must be big, because really with acute viral infections there's unlikely to be a magic bullet it really you can expect modest benefits but modest benefits in a pandemic can stack up into very large improvements in the number of patients not getting to not, not getting to icu or not dying so we were aiming for um, moderate benefits um, that we would be able to detect and also remembering that small trials kill drugs you can do a small trial that's negative but it's negative because it's underpowered and then it's very hard then to get people to um, engage or fund future um, studies of that drug. So you have to be very wary about killing off drugs um, inadvertently. So we kept it very simple. All the materials are available online. And if you want to go to our website, um, which is recoverytrial.net, everything is there. All the regulatory submissions, all of the intervention sheets, um, all of the, 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 the um, PDFs of the, of the CRFs, the case record forms and the consent forms, et cetera, are there. So everything is completely transparent. Um, we did not require GCP training. GCP itself does not require you to be GCP trained. What it requires is that the staff running the study are appropriately trained. Um, and we, we judged that, that uh, clinical staff, doctors prescribing medicines are well enough trained to prescribe the drugs we were using. The training was all online. We didn't want to have to do face-to-face -face training. So people did an online training course. You can see the um, pictures of those on the right. And then they just filled in an online form to confirm they had completed the training. The consent form was very simple. The information sheet was two pages. The consent form was two pages. Um, patients are sick, often elderly. We have to keep this very simple. And it was available in multiple languages. And all of these are available online. The randomization was very simple. It's, this is the form. It's very, very, very clear. Um, we only require absolutely essential data, eligibility, some basic characteristics of the patients, um, the suitability of those patients for those drugs and the availability of those drugs. So the situation was we had several drugs in. If the drug was not available at your site or was not suitable for your patient, then the patient would not be randomized to that drug. Um, and that meant that we could roll out the study to many, many um, hospitals, even though we didn't have drugs at all those hospitals from day one. They could start with what they had available in the hospital and then use other drugs as they became available. So the online follow-up form is very simple as well. It just records what the patients received, the outcomes, discharge status and use of, of ventilation and, and renal support, etc. Um, and in the UK, we're lucky to have a National Health Service with linkage to national data. So we are getting follow up on all patients on death certification um, and hospital episode statistics. So we can do follow up without actually contacting the patients. And we have consent to do that for up to 10 years. <coughs> Sorry, let me get rid of that. Um, so we drafted the protocol on 10th of March. That was when we wrote the first draft of the protocol. And we enrolled the first patient <clears throat> on 19th of March. So we managed to beat our 20 days. So nine days from the first draft of the protocol to enrolling the first patient was just 90, nine, nine days. Um, after I did 20 days with Professor Bin in China, I, I said at a presentation I would have to retire because we'd never beat that record. And I, we amazingly did with just nine days. And we managed to start very early in the epidemic in the UK. So if you look at this, this is the, um, the epidemic in the UK, cases and deaths um, from March up until May. 
uh, and that's when we enrolled the first trial patient. So very early, um, which meant that we could capture this big peak. And this shows you the, the distribution. So because of the National Health Service, we, we got one single um, ethical approval, we got one single regulatory approval, and we sent out a contract to all these hospitals and said, here it is, take it or leave it. We're not negotiating contracts with 170 hospitals and all of the hospitals signed up. So you can see here, we have more than 175 hospitals who have enrolled patients. And the size of the green circle shows you the number of relative number of patients enrolled in each of the hospitals. And the graph on the right shows you the daily recruitment numbers. You can see there's a weekend effect when staff are not recruiting much. But um, you can see at the peak, we were enrolling more than 400 patients per day. So at that time, we were enrolling more patients per day than any single trial you know, to that time had, had done in total. So we managed to go very simple, very big, very quickly and managed to capture enough patients. So this shows you where we are now. This shows you um, that the baseline recruitment is the red line. Um, we're currently at um, 12,200 patients randomized. We started um, tocilizumab, which is a, a, an anti-inflammatory drug as a second line for patients who deteriorated. We're now up to 840 randomized for that arm of the trial. And then we started convalescent plasma, which was collected through the National Blood Transfusion Service once we were getting convalescent patients. And we're now up to 320 plus patients um, in that arm. So we're now, that, so it's the biggest trial um, globally of, of randomized treatments for COVID in hospitalized patients. It's the biggest trial of tocilizumab, and to our knowledge, that it's currently the biggest randomized trial of convalescent plasma. Uh, it's open to everyone, so we wanted to keep it um, as, a, as a national trial, open to all patients. So we did not have an age restriction. We did initially, but then we stopped it. And you can see down here, our youngest patient is less than one year old, and our oldest patient is 102. So the age range is more than a century. And just to show you how simple it is, we collect <clears throat> data on the time from um, opening a, a sort of a case record for a patient and the doctor seeing what the patient is randomised to, and you can see here that the mean uh, time from opening the case notes on the patient and the randomization being given is seven minutes. So this is really not taking much time of the patients and that's of the staff. And that's why um, we've managed to recruit so many patients because it can be done on a busy ward integrated with clinical care. So the results so far, um, these are the treatments we started with. Um, Initially, so we started with the antiviral treatments, lopinavir, ritonavir, an HIV drug, hydroxychloroquine, you all have heard about. Um, convalescent plasma, we've added most recently as an antiviral treatment. And then treatments for the immunological um, inflammatory process, we started with dexamethasone, um, a steroid at low doses, um, because previous data was some of it positive, some of it negative, um, but many, many questions outstanding as to whether this would help or not. Azithromycin, it's an antibiotic, but for its anti-inflammatory products, um, anti-inflammatory um, properties. And then tocilizumab, which is a rather expensive um, um, interleukin-6 inhibitor, but that's for the patients that get severe inflammation as a second stage. So six drugs in total. And this is how it, it, it has developed. It wasn't like this at the start, but it's developed into this, where the initial randomization here you're, at, you're randomized to standard of care plus uh, plus or minus lupinavir, dexamethasone, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and then there's a parallel randomization to convalescent plasma or no convalescent plasma. And so you're in one of these boxes. And then if you deteriorate, um, an additional randomization to tocilizumab or not. So quickly, quickly run through the results. The, the hydroxychloroquine was the first result to be, um, to be reported. Um, this was um, looking at the mortality rates, and we enrolled um, 1,500 patients on hydroxychloroquine compared to 3,000 patients on control. And you can see that there's hydroxychloroquine is on the wrong side, it's on the higher mortality side, uh, but not significant. So really the, the um, conclusion is that it does not improve mortality in hospitalised patients. And if we look in subgroups, I won't go through this in detail, but if we, if we um, stratify that by age or gender or time since onset or requirement for respiratory support. Um, all of these plots are on the wrong side. Uh, their, their usual care is better than hydroxychloroquine, although none of them are statistically significant. So overall, the conclusion is that hydroxychloroquine doesn't help. 
uh, no reduction in 28 million mortality, an increase in the duration of hospitalization, that's uh, this parameter here, sorry, and, and it possibly an increased risk of progression to mechanical ventilation or death. The next arm to read out was dexamethasone, um, which um, was closed because we reached the sample size, which was um, 2,000 patients roughly on treatment. And so we had 2,000 patients on dexamethasone and 4,000 on usual care. And what we saw was the reverse, that actually dexamethasone was associated with a decreased risk of death at day 28 and, and highly statistically significant. But this wasn't the full picture. That was the overall result. But when we looked in pre-specified analysis by subgroups, um, there was a very different result. So in those invasively um, mechanically ventilated, so on a, on a breathing machine, dexamethasone really was very impressively better and it reduced the risk of death by about 30%. In those who required oxygen, it was also beneficial, but not quite as strong, about 20% reduction in the risk of death. But in those who were hospitalized with mild disease and didn't require oxygen, there was no benefit, um, not statistically significant, and if anything, on the wrong side, compatible with harm. So really, this is, this is the correct answer. Um, it's beneficial, uh, big, big benefit in reducing death rate in invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, significant, um, but, but smaller, um, benefit if you're on oxygen and no benefit if you're not on oxygen. This is what we should be reporting. And again, if we look at subgroups by age, gender, time since onset, etc., this time they're all on the correct side of the line with dexamethasone being better. So it appears that dexamethasone does help um, in all patient subgroups except those who have only mild illness. And we also saw benefits in terms of um, uh, reduced time in hospital and reduced risk of, of progression to mechanical ventilation. So all of, all of the data um, clearly indicating that it is a beneficial drug in hospitalised patients who require respiratory support. Um, and finally, lupinavir, ritonavir has read out. Um, this is not yet, we, we, we did a press release, but we don't have the data out yet. It should be coming out soon. Um, what we saw with 1,600 patients on lupinavir, ritonavir and 3,000 on control, no reduction in mortality, no difference in duration of hospitalization, and no difference in risk of progression to mechanical ventilation or death. None of it's statistically significant. Very unlikely that this drug has a beneficial effect in this patient group, so we suspended that arm as well. So where we are currently, we now have um, azithromycin, about 1,000 patients on treatment versus 2,000 on control. Uh, convalescent plasma, as you saw, about 160 in each arm here, and tocilizumab here, about um, 400 in each arm here. And we're currently talking about adding another antiviral, uh, an anti-spike antibody, so a monoclonal antibody, or possibly anticoagulants, because we are going to continue this trial over the coming winter. Uh, so just to say thank you to our funders um, and our supporters, which includes really the NHS, the Department of Health, and the NIHR, which is the National Health Research Infrastructure, which has made this all possible. Um, an enormous thanks really to the thousands of doctors and staff and nurses across the NHS um, in over 170 hospitals who've been recruiting patients um, and most importantly to the patients who agreed to participate. Thank you, David. Hey, Peter, thank you so much. That was uh, spectacular, yeah. elegant, efficient. Uh, we very much appreciate that. We've got questions. Hopefully you're up for them. Yeah. Um, there is a certain David Lai from Singapore who says, hi, yeah. Peter. With such, <laughs> with such a, a high mortality in patients not on oxygen and patient profile being comparable or similar to NIH Act and Gilead 5773, how reproducible uh, are the UK recovery dexamethasone trial data to other parts of the world with a much lower mortality? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. What we saw was that you know, patients who require respiratory support, there, there was a benefit, and that benefit was consistent across all subgroups, and it was also consistent on other endpoints, so duration of ventilation, um, duration of time in the hospital, need for ventilation. Um, and there is a meta-analysis. Um, so there were other there were other steroid trials that um, um, were done, and, and there is a, a meta-analysis that is um, being submitted for, or has been submitted for publication. And I think what we would say is that uh, I think that the, the data is strong enough to say that, that there is an effect of steroids in patients who have the inflammatory stage of their disease um, and that it's probably a class effect. 
Um, and I think it's reasonable to say that at the moment, <clears throat> it may not be beneficial, may even be harmful in, in, in patients who are only mildly unwell. And I suspect that is transferable to patient populations with a lower mortality, because the mortality is really, a lot of it is associated with age. You know, we see lower mortality in, in some countries, but the average age is also much lower. Our average age was in the 70s, whereas in other countries with lower mortality, the average age of hospitalised patients is in the 50s. But what we did see was that benefit was consistent across ages. Um, it was the severity metric where it changed. So I think it would be beneficial. The question now is how do you test that um, um, in a trial? Because I think we would like to test that. We'd also like to test whether you've seen the same beneficial effect of steroids if you don't have access to invasive mechanical ventilation or you don't have access to oxygen in, in low middle income countries. Uh, the question that's troubling me, and please send in answers uh, on a postcard, as to how we would answer those questions, given that um, what we already know about the potential benefits of this drug. Um, so any uh, mention of immunocompromised host HIV patients with uh, regard to the recovery trial, uh, specifically the dexamethasone arm? Yeah, we didn't have enough patients with HIV. There were some, but not enough to, to make any, any conclusions on that. Okay. Uh, there's a couple questions uh, regarding the process uh, of getting the uh, trial going. Uh, Yohendran uh, Baskarin in Singapore was, uh, was the acceleration for grant awards and patient recruitment for the trials a result of more people reviewing the process or a reduction in the steps of the process? The steps were very simple in the UK. There was, there was um, you know, we have one regulator, so we had regu one regulatory approval. Um, um, we had one research infrastructure, the National Institute of Health Research, which reviewed, reviewed the protocol, and we had one um, ethics committee, um, which meant that the, 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 um, the hospitals could agree or not agree, but we, we, we didn't have to engage in um, you know, discussions with each of the hospital's ethics committees. Um, and we and normally we'd have a problem of negotiating you know individual site level contracts but because of the emergency we said look this is it take it or leave it you either sign this contract or you're not in, in the study um, <clears throat> and luckily yeah there was such a um, national um, desire to, to see um, good evidence on treatments for COVID that the hospitals all, all agreed to be part of it and so it was it was very very streamlined um, and we were in a sense we started the study with with drugs that we knew a lot about you know so we started with azithromycin dexamethasone lipinavir and oxychloroquine um, and so we knew a lot about those drugs so that that made the regulatory process easier because um, we, we knew who would be contraindicated and we knew what the side effects were likely to be leo you sin would like to know now that dexamethasone has become the standard of care how does that impact your subsequent trial yeah so we'll have to you know, standard of care now in the UK. So the day we announced the results, actually a, a letter went out from the chief medical officers saying it should become standard of care for patients who require any kind of ventilatory support. And so um, we will have to now, we do collect that information. <clears throat> we collect information now on, on remdesivir, um, which is being used a bit in the UK, but not much, um, and um, the use of steroids so that we can look at any interaction. But um, it should reduce the death rate as well, which will mean that we'll have to have a bigger study <laughs> well, so, because the outcome rates will, will be lower. So we're just continuing. Uh, and now tocilizumab, which is the interleukin-6 inhibitor, another immunomodulator, we're now almost testing a different question, which is what's the additional benefit of tocilizumab on top of um, dexamethasone? Hmm. So the statisticians have been busy you know, reconfiguring their analysis plans. Uh, Damon Eisen from Australia asks, how do you control for improvements in ICU management, such as ventilator, uh, ventilator management, that have, uh, that have improved uh, through the outbreak? Yeah, so I think that's an important point. Consistently, we see in outbreaks improvements in, well, improvements in outcomes, and that, I think that's partly due to improvements in patient referral um, and patients pitching up earlier at hospital, and partly due to you know better diagnostics and better care, um, and uh, the way to deal with that really is with concurrent randomization. You have to make sure that your you know, your your, your randomised groups are um, you know are, are concurrent, and that you have to be very wary of um, you know using um, historic controls or controls that were randomised much earlier in the outbreak. 
Great. Uh, Ashok Kurup would like to know, would you consider dexamethasone for those who are becoming hypoxic but having less than seven days of symptoms? Yes, I would. Yeah. I think the, because um, what we saw in the subgroup analysis was benefit um, you know, in most subgroups. It was not so clear in the less than seven days, but I think that's really, in, in a sense, not a confounder, but it's on the causal pathway. You know, so patients at seven days tend to be the patients who are um, either um, not going to become severe or um, pre-severe. And but clearly the, the patients that Y-box have benefited. So I think that's the key, key clinical indicator. If, if this is a patient you wanted to give oxygen to, if you had it, then that's a patient you'll probably benefit. Uh, how did you select the dose of dexamethasone? Were you influenced by prior experience with uh, MERS and SARS? Yeah, so there was a protocol which um, one of my colleagues, um, Wei Shen Lim, had written called the ASAP uh, protocol, which was, was a pre-prepared protocol for pandemic influenza for a study of, of steroids in pandemic influenza. Um, and, and we used the dose for that. Wei Shen is on our steering committee. Um, and it's basically a dose that is you know, widely used for inflammatory lung conditions, um, but is not as high as the doses that we saw in SARS and other diseases which seem to be associated with harm. So it was a, we were going for a, um, what ICU doctors would call a low dose, but others might call a, call a moderate dose. Um, but it was, it was informed by a review of data in SARS, MERS, but also influenza. Do you believe there'll be a single game-changing treatment, a small molecule uh, antiviral, a combination therapy, uh, um, a monoclonal? Are we looking at incremental improvements in survival from our interventions, or is there going to be a game-changer? I think uh, I hesitate to answer that question because I would have said no, but actually the effect we saw of dexamethasone in uh, patients on ICU was was dramatic and it was actually greater than sort of I think an ICU physician told me that's the biggest effect we've seen in any ICU in the last any ICU trial in the last 10 years 30% uh, reduction in the risk of death so that was quite significant and I think if we can get a very effective antiviral in early as well as effective immunomodulators in later we could um, have a significant benefit I, I'm sure there will always be a significant mortality because what we're seeing is that um, you know, it's a particular vulnerability in, in the elderly frail patients. And I think there are many of those who could not be salvaged by an antiviral and an immune modulator. But I think together we could have a substantial effect, yes. Catherine Ong has asked, uh, were the clinical samples such as respiratory samples and blood samples who are collected from the COVID patients? And if they were, were the various regulatory approvals for handling of those samples and their readouts uh, in the uh, uh, category three or BSL three lab equally fast? So we didn't collect any biological samples. So ah. we decided, um, you know, this isn't a phase two trial. We're looking for surrogates of outcomes. We're going to get a lot of patients. We can, we can go for an outcome trial. Let's go for something that really matters. Do patients die or not? Do they end up on a ventilator? And we don't care if the viral load goes down or not. What we care about is whether people survive or not. So we didn't, and, and that was, a definite decision to make sure the trial could be run in 170 hospitals with 400 patients a day. No samples. I would think that that would simplify the process enormously. It does. <laughs> yeah. um, just a slightly different uh, jump here uh, question. You serve on the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, which is a UK governmental advisory body to the central government. What's that experience been like? You've been a lifelong uh, clinical scientist, and now you're in a position of advising government and uh, dealing with the, uh, the publicity associated with that. How's that uh, experience been? It's been uh, fascinating, really. I've, I've, I've enjoyed it, but um, you know, it, it clearly demonstrates, the, I think, the need for independent scientific advice, but also the appreciation that scientific advice is advice, because we're giving advice based on what we know about the epidemiology, the clinical pathology, the virology, whereas ministers and governments are making decisions based on many other factors as well, including economics. Um, you know, so that they have other considerations to make. Um, and so the scientific advice does not always translate directly into policy because of, uh, for lots of reasons. Um, but, you know, as a, 
Um, I think the, the, the early stages there was criticism about the lack of transparency of that committee, but that was not because we had anything to hide, but it was because we felt it might be distracting. But in the end, um, we decided that actually now all, all the papers are, are made um, available and all the members of the committee, everybody knows who they are. And we're fr free to speak our minds if we wish to. So has it uh, in some been a, a positive experience or frustrating? It's generally been positive, positive. Uh, you know, I think I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about wording as well. Uh, you, we, in our in our in our statements and minutes of because I chair another committee, nerve tag. We have to be extremely careful about how you word things so that the, the meaning is very clear because it can be very easily misinterpreted. Peter, thank you so much. We're going to move to the next segment, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll close up after that. Dale, over to you. Thank you. I'm sort of thinking, can't we stay with Peter? <laughs> Okay, well, I'm just going to uh, have a couple of uh, quick things this week, uh, David, because uh, we expected to, to run out of time. Uh, just going to talk about some of the comments from the WHO on young people, uh, talk about outlet valves. They've come up a few times in the last week and, uh, and we're in the, in the wake of National Day. So uh, I was just going to go out on that uh, happy note. Uh, so firstly, young people, um, the, uh, you, you might remember the... Director General and, and Mike Ryan and others were, were saying uh, there's more young people getting infected and don't forget you can also get sick and don't forget uh, you, you can transmit to others that could die. So, so uh, this, this was taken up. Uh, we even turned it into a, a cartoon in the COVID Chronicles. But just to show you the WHO data that, that, that I got was um, the, the top one is is cases by age group and, and the bottom one is deaths by age group. So every case, uh, the WHO asks for a case report form uh, so that they can keep an analysis of all the cases. So obviously they've done quite well really to have 6 million out of uh, well, what's now uh, 20 million. Um, and this is taken between the 24th of February and the 12th of July. Now, there are some, some caveats, obviously. The, the settings is, have obviously changed. This is uh, week 9, 10, 11 of the, of the, um, uh, of the year. And uh, this was Europe. This was Italy. So we know there were a lot more uh, elderly people involved in those outbreaks, uh, also in Germany. And uh, obviously now for the last few months, uh, places like the US and, and Brazil have contributed uh, a large number of these cases. But, but nonetheless, as you go through, you can see that um, the cases, so this, uh, this orange bar, uh, that started at 0.8% and it's gone up to 4.6%. So these are people aged five to 14. The purple bar is people aged 15 to 24, and that's gone from 0.8 up to 4.6%. Up to and, and the, the um, Sorry, the, the, the purple bar has gone from 4.5 up to 15%. So that's the one that's, that's tripled in those sort of older teenage groups. And you can see that obviously the yellow bar, which is 25 to 64 year olds, that's also obviously gotten bigger. So this will be bigger in terms of uh, total numbers as, as well as the proportion. Uh, the other two groups, uh, the, the green is the, or the aqua, whatever, 65 to 84, and the dark green is over over uh, 85. So the proportion's gone down. We, we can't really talk about the numbers in this. Uh, but uh, down on the deaths, you can see that, uh, that now half, about half the deaths are actually people that are 64 or, or less. So I, I think this is um, uh, a useful message to send, but nonetheless, this was the, the, the data. They wondered if it was uh, about risky behavior in people, young people coming out of lockdowns. Uh, and, and when other social um, distancing measures and, and others were, were lifted. Uh, also possibly the, avail uh, the availability of testing. So just the point I wanted to make on this was, I don't think it's completely fair to, to blame young people. Um, uh, I, as I watch the media and, 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 and read and listen, uh, I, I do wonder if the messaging is a bit same um, a lot of politicians, a lot of academics giving the giving the messaging, and I just wonder if messaging 
globally could be more targeted to, to, to different groups and get, because uh, messaging is, it's about how you do it. Um, it's about which medium you use. It's how frequent, uh, what content do you want? Uh, is it being said in the right language? And, and I don't mean English, French and, and German, I mean, or Mandarin. I mean, uh, is it being said in the, the right way to that particular target group of people? And, and is it being done on social media or whatever? So, so rather than just blame the, the young people, maybe we should take a listen and, and uh, uh, a look at the data and say, could we message them any better? Most certainly they, they can get sick and we've had uh, several deaths in Victoria of people in their 50s uh, over the last few days. So, um, and, and obviously we know that uh, just transmitting it will eventually find itself to, uh, to people who can die from it. Um, so that's all on, on that topic. I wanted to talk about these outlet valves. Um, there's, as people are going to uh, buying more masks, there's more choice coming about. And I want people to be a little bit uh, more insightful. The, these outlets, um, th these are good if you've got a lot of dust around, for instance, because you want the protection on coming in. But the main reason we wear a mask is actually to protect those around us. So in theory, if a person is in the pre-symptomatic phase, for instance, and they don't have symptoms of COVID, then we're safe because everyone's wearing a mask. However, if this is a, a, a valve which doesn't filter on the way out, it only filters on the way in, it's a one-way valve, then actually the mask is not doing what it is intended for. So my, my message is, even if you find these a little bit easier to, to, uh, to wear and breathe through, uh, this is not something we should be doing. It's, 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 not, uh, it's not doing the job for which it's intended. You could still be spreading COVID. Okay, and my last point, you know I like to to look for a, a happy note to finish on, David. So the weekend we saw Singapore National Day and that picture on the left is not what it was like. This is from, from past years and you can see this is exactly what we don't want. There's, there's no masks, there's, there's crowding, there's no social distancing. There's a lot of joy and we like that. But uh, what Singapore did was uh, they, they took the National Day Parade to the people. They had, uh, they, they had uh, tanks and, and other, uh, other uh, sites going to these five areas. And then they had the fireworks in five different uh, areas as well. So it was about don't come in and make a crowd. I think it's typically uh, smart stuff from, from organizers here. Um, so that's what I want to go out on tonight, David, is the, the video uh, of the healthcare workers that uh, were all saluted. So uh, Joe, if you could play that. Heading 050 over Changi. This is a roar of unity for all the frontline heroes. Thank you for your sacrifices. Happy birthday, Singapore. How about taking a moment to thank the frontline? Happy to join the celebration. How about thinking of others who can't stay home? How about standing up for the ones we love? Thank you, doctors. Thank you, nurses. Thanks for working the front line. Thank you, scientists. Thank you, pharmacists.
when the public clap for us, uh, I'm excited. My clicks are excited. All these videos and personal messages that we receive really motivates us and helps us to soldier on. I can't, I can't top any of those comments, David. Back to you. Dale, thanks. That's, uh, we very much appreciate you sharing that with us. I'm just wondering, for one of our final episodes, maybe you can uh, arrange for us to get a little lift on the uh, Jets? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll get straight on to it after we finish the show. I appreciate that. It leads me to thank Peter for sharing his, uh, his beautiful, elegant work with us, uh, his insight, his experience, and taking time from his busy day. We, we can't thank him enough. And to introduce next week's speaker, Maria Van Kirkhoff, who's head of Emerging Diseases and Zoonosis Unit, as well as COVID-19 Health Ops and Technical Lead, MERS-CoV Technical Lead, and Global Infectious Hazard Preparedness Health Emergencies Program, all within the World Health Organization. The title of her talk will be Science and Global Health uh, Guidance in the Time of COVID-19. There's a chat box at the bottom of your screen. We look forward to your feedback. Please use the chat box. It'll be open for another 10 minutes or so. We look forward to your comments. Until next week, stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands, and don't forget to send in your suggestion for Pandemic Song of the Week. Finally, this week's Pandemic Song of the Week is an oldie but a goodie. It was contributed by Marian Neubronner, Head of Client Partnerships and Senior Assistant Director, National University of Singapore Continuing Education and Training, who's reminded us of what we're all missing while social distancing. From the Beatles, it's I Want to Hold Your Hand. Good night. <laughs>